Okay, so good afternoon, good evening, and good morning from whichever part of the world you belong to. Welcome to the 31st session of the online Optom Learning Series. Uh, we are also happy to let you all know that online Optom Learning Series is an accredited uh, credit provider by the Optometry Council of India. So uh, Indian optometrists who are registered with Optometry Council of India uh, are awarded two CE points to attend one live session. Let me introduce you to the speaker for today. Today we have uh, Dr. Nitesh Bharat. Uh, he is a very well-known ortho case specialist. Just a bit of background about him. He graduated from the Aston University, UK. He is the president of the British Indo-Pacific Orthokeratology Myopia Control Academy. He is also a fellow of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control. He specializes in fitting orthokeratology, orthoke lenses, soft and rigid lenses on traumatized corneas. He is an executive secretary of the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, and he is also a founding board member of the Euro OK. He is an international lecturer, mentor, and examiner for the International Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopia Control, and a member of the British College of Optometry, and is also a facilitator, examiner, and a member of the BCLA and the International Opticians Association. So we are very happy and privileged to have uh, Dr. Nitesh with us, and he is going to share his views about orthokeratology in practice. What do we need to do when we want to set up the practice, and uh, what are the tips on post-COVID orthoke practice? So welcome, Dr. Nitesh, and uh, we are very eagerly waiting for your session. Thank you, uh, Fakhruddin, for uh, in, uh, the invitation to obviously to, uh, talk on OLS. And I'm glad there's a quite a large turnout and quite a few of just looking on the chat line that uh, the people I've met before in Mumbai and Goa and also in uh, possibly in Vietnam too. So looking forward to this session and I hope I can give you some insight into why you should be doing orthokeratology. So let's start the topic. So I just need to make sure my slides Moving, yes. Now, what we need in ortho-K practice, obviously, first of all, we all need to think about is myopia control, uh, ortho-K right for you? Now, we need to think about myopia. Does it get better? At the moment, we know around the world, all the lectures going around myopia, there is an epidemic. We are all aware of it. So ortho-K has been known and all research has been done to show that ortho-K is the one which actually gives you the be best correction. Uh, uh, to control it. Then there are other modalities which are available, but I'm only going to be talking about ortho -K at the moment. So with myopia, it is one of the best with the statistics that, that are out there and research that's been done. Now, also the advantage of ortho -K is you'll be primarily seeing a lot of patients who are children. And patients will travel. Parents are really worried about their children. Now, we always talk about myopia control, but let's, let's look at it this way. If you look at it as a disability, myopia is a disability. If a child takes off his glasses and a minus three has not got much vision there, 660 uh, if possible. Now, when you've got an ortho K overnight one, you're gonna give them a better vision. It's a 24 hours. It's not like a walking stick. So if, if you think of it, somebody who's disabled with a walking stick, this is the same comparison you can make with myopia. So to be, to me, that's the important reason why you should be doing ortho-K. Ortho-K has been controversial. And also we need to understand that ortho-K is not a normal contact lens fitting. It is different. And therefore the fee presentation has to be orchestrated. So there is a little bit of a difference with how you deal with ortho-K. Ortho-K is more a therapy. We are doing a therapy on a patient and changing the cornea. So the fees have to be presented in that way. Also, ortho -K is long term. It's not somebody coming to you and buying a pair of glasses and disappearing for a couple of years and then coming back. Either they're broken or they need an eye test. With ortho -K, you need investment of equipment. Doing ortho -K without the right equipment is not really a possible realistically and shouldn't be done without the right equipment which I'll talk about in a minute 
and then with author k you have to learn now today i'm glad because there's a lot of people have come up to, to listen to this uh, talk in reality we all need to learn and i'm learning as even today there is there is a learning curve author k is not just easy it has to be learned as you go along but the most important thing when you do author k is it's going to make a stronger pillar in your practice that's what you got to look at it's going to be a the pillar which is what you need like holding a building it's one of your pillars for your economy hello there's a large barrier to entry in author k because again it's lot not many people are doing it because of all the other factors i've just mentioned it is a niche market it's a very very niche market not every optometrist and ophthalmologist is doing it and even in uk we have got 14000 uh, you know uh, optometrists at the moment in the uk and maybe 200 or, or few than that are actually fitting author k again the advantage of author k i talked about my IPA, it stabilizes it but again in your case if you're going to use it in practice it increases the revenue now what is other things which we have to think about there is co corporate competition today with the normal stuff you're doing you've got supermarkets providing glasses internet providing glasses LASIK is again on your competition list this now the profitability pyramid this is how i de define my practice and what i look at. today is I glaucoma professional services and vision therapy and also k right at the top and that's in my practice i find also k is the most profitable for me today then vision therapy then other professional services i provide for diabetic care and all elsewhere glaucoma comes further down dry eye is now climbing up it used to be way down also glasses is way down is because now i've got competition around with the supermarkets and everybody else lastic again there's too many people doing lastic now all over the place and with lastic one thing you need to remember children can't be done you have to be 18 to 21 before you can do lastic so there is a big gap for if you do that children to stabilize the myopia there's an advantage if they even have lastic done at a late stage and then in presbyopia you can have them back And contact lenses again you need to be aware it's now there's so much competition you can go on the internet and buy them the daily disposables are available everywhere and soon with the myopia multifocal lenses will be available on the internet too also okay requires a lot more training and fitting and you need a lot more equipment to deal with what makes an author k candidate a good candidate now we have to look at refractive behavioral and topographic all those factors have to be taken into account to choose the right candidate for ortho k now what you need to bear in mind is i'm talking to you at the moment as if you're going to be coming into ortho k so the, looking at the ortho k candidates i'm going to talk about the refractive what you need is low myopia minus one to minus four myopia obviously greater than astigmatism cylinder 0.75 with the rule and central k is between 41 and 45 this if you stick to this initially you will find it's easy and very simple to do and this doesn't take much effort to do those patients again what you talk about in your practice practice how you pr describe it to the patient so you can call it corneal refractive therapy. I call it corneal therapy. You can call it ortho K or molding or GV, gentle vision shaping lenses and device known as molds or retainers, etc. So you can look at it ortho K as orthodontist. As I said, I've just put it, the picture below is showing you what you're trying to do. Health consideration. Again, look for looking for the candidate. If you got a no lead disease ideal candidate but if they've got black pritis or something like that then treat that first sort that out and then do ortho k make sure there's no corneal pathology of any kind no severely dry eyes again here i'm talking to you guys who are new if you are used to this uh, ortho k for a number of years you can actually treat dry eyes with ortho k but that 
that's an, another lecture in the future. Patients in reasonably good health is very, very vital. And the good social info. Just one second. Patient is clean, patient and family motivated, is age appropriately mature, motivated by sports, like swimmers, hikers, bikers, motivated by occupation, law enforcement, military, pilot, lifeguard, they're all suitable for ortho K. But where I talked about age appropriately mature means is the child capable of handling the lenses themselves? Or are they kept, are you, can you put them in their eye and are, will they allow the parents to do it? That is one of the factors which we have to make sure because we're going to be dealing with kids here. And if the patient and the family are highly motivated, then it is very, very easy to fit ortho K. And the patient's cleanliness is important. They walk into your practice, look at them, look at their hands, nails, you know, the dima, how they look, what have the hair, all that, because that makes a difference. If they're clean, therefore, you know, they'll be listening to you on the hygiene. Again, the refractor have come back to uh, hyperopia. It can be done, but in this stage, avoid it. Again, anything minus 450 myopia, avoid it at early stages. Astigmatism greater than myopia, again, avoid it at this early stages. Cylinder, again, greater than minus 150, it can be done. I do it regularly, but in your case, avoid it while you're new to this. Against the rule, again, astigmatism, same thing. Limber to limbal cell, same thing. Tip or okay cave. Uh, flats, which is I'm repeating this, but this is a very important when you're going into ortho K. Choose your patients wisely. Get 10, 20 patients in your practice so that you have got a very good rapport with them and they've been fitted well and they'll be talking about. So when you do the complicated cases later, which will cost you more money sometimes when you have to do it two or three times the lenses, it's easier. Neil, this is again, I've talked about health consideration. I'm repeating this because it's a mantra which we have to watch for when we're fitting ortho K. No, if there's a corneal disease, no. Like keratoconus, avoid it if in the early stages. Definitely do not fit them if you're not used to fitting ortho K. Severely dry eyes, persistent lead disease. If a patient is pregnant, then again, do not fit if it's a new patient. Herpix. Hope is again avoid, and again you can see that the picture here, which is a, de a demodex, again clear that, then you can fit. If the child is immature, fearful, I'm again repeating from my previous slides. Again, you need to get the child to become much more listening to you, and is not fearful. Then do fit them. Helicopter patients are the pa parents are the ones who actually are moving around. They're not all with their children on, on a regular basis. Again, you don't have a supervision, so I would be worried if the, the patient, uh, parents are traveling or whatever. Child is not clean. That's a no, no, no for fitting. Engineer type personality where they're asking you so many questions when you answer them, every one of them, and yet they're still not satisfied. Avoid. Internet interrupted sleep patterns like firefighters and insomniacs avoid fitting ortho k the ugly rx as i call it is plus four and greater than minus 10. now again i fit a lot higher but with you guys i have to stress do not fit those people choose your candidates carefully do not be actually too enthusiastic curb your enthusiasm Important is fees versus chair, chair time. You're going to spend a lot of hours on pay, uh, fitting the, an ortho K patient. So your charges must be pro, uh, proportionate to your chair time. Fees with number of lenses. I mean, to me, the number of lenses is not a case. Nowadays, you can fit one fit lens on most patients if you do it properly with your measurements and everything. So it's important how you charge. Education warnings and discussions. Now let's look at education. How will you explain orthokeratology to a patient or a parent? And you know the definition is very simple. Orthokeratology is a non-surgical procedure specifically designed to contact lenses to gently shape the curvature of the eye to improve vision. This is the definition from the American Academy of Orthokeratology and Myopic Control. 
But is this what you will tell your patients? They will not understand that. I would explain it slightly differently. I'll come to that in a minute. Now, some practitioners around the world are saying orthokeratology uses a rigid permeable lens. Curves on the lens create pushing and pulling forces that reshape the eye surface. The result is clear vision without the use of daytime glasses or contact lenses. Now, once you talk about push and pull, to a parent thinks you're pushing the cornea down, you know, and pulling the cornea. So you may be damaging the cornea. So why not change that? I always say to them, I'm going to put a corneal mold on your eye. What it'll do is hydrate the cornea and reshape that cornea into a shape that will make vision possible. Now here I've not used any technical terms, push, pull, or anything. It'll be water held under the lens. That will obviously wet the epithelial cells, but I will not even mention epithelial cells. I say the cornea will be wet. So the example I give them is put a finger inside a glass of water and leave it for five minutes. What happens to the skin? Or when you came out of a shower, what's the skin like? It's softer, it's malleable, it's moldable. And therefore, this mold will then remold that shape of the cornea to match the back of the eye, the retina. And that's how your son or daughter will be able to see clearly. So that's a very simple way to explain rather than going through this pull and push forces, which sometimes people get scared of. And when I started earlier on, there were optometrists telling them, when a parent went to ask another optometrist, and they would say, oh, he's pushing down the cornea, and that's what he'll damage your cornea. So you shouldn't do that. So again, explain in simple terms. So again, here coming up to how does orthokeratology slow myopia prevention? Develop a script, use patient-friendly words, avoid words like defocus, elongation, hyperopic, or myopia. So what you do not is hyperopic defocus, myopia defocus. I personally would just say, I'll draw basically a picture on a piece of paper where I show the curvature of the cornea and the lens. And if they're matching, that means this ray is getting there straight and there. The ray there is getting straight and there. So what you're seeing is the ray, this cornea shape, changes shape. The middle ray gets straight there. The other ray is coming in there, will get there. So from here, it'll get there similarly, but without using elongation, hyperopic, or myopia. Simplistic makes it a lot easier for a patient to understand. If a patient understands, they will go for it. But if you give them Technical terms, which we, you hear uh, at all conferences, it will not make a difference to the patient. So get used to describing complicated concepts in language. Standard lenses and contact lenses focus the image in a flat plane. Now this, again, to me, is what a lot of practitioners are using. Central image in focus images from sight vision are behind the retina. You don't notice to peripheral vision, always a little out of focus. I notices it and elongates to compensate increase in myopia. Each new lens or contact lens prescription makes it worse. Now, it is a very good explanation, don't get me wrong, but it wouldn't be simple if you just uh, say to him, this is your code eye. I don't know whether you can see my image, uh, what I'm doing with my hands, and that. Now, if you look at that, what, there is one going to overcorrect, there is going to overcorrect you properly, and then it's overcorrecting. So on the glasses, that's what happens. With the, also, okay, you're doing the same shape, shape, easy. What are the risks associated with orthokeratology? You need to discuss this. Do not avoid the discussion on this, because if you avoid it, at some point they find out from somebody, they're going to come back and ask you these questions. So why not discuss this up front? And in a contract which we make, we always say these are the possibilities if you don't do it right. So be prepared to discuss microbial keratitis, acanthamoeba, also, how do those risks compare to other options? It is a must that you discuss this. Now, OrthoK has been done safely since the 1980s. 1997 to 2001, there were 47 cases of microbial keratitis in China and Taiwan. Now, remember, they will go on Google Doctor and find out this if you have not told them this. So it's better before they go to Google, you tell them this. This is what the facts are. Acanthamoeba and pseudonomous infections due to huge need, no protocols were there. So the, in China, in those years, OrthoK took off in a big way, and there were no protocols on regulation or on hygiene or training on patients. So 
what happened was China reached out to us lot at IMC for training and we changed the protocol there. And that protocol now has been applied everywhere. When we go lecturing around, we are trying to say to use use the right training and be educated. Go to these conferences, get these webinars. Today, I mean, we ah! call it oops, the fact that training worldwide. So this has changed now. In China, there's no, hardly any infection now because it's always fitted in hospitals by qualified people and also training of the patient in insertion removal and disinfection is now. Uh, uh, an utmost important thing. Again, talk about research by Mark Berlimer. The risk approximately the same as our Nikon Islands and other modalities. Now, care protocol, International Academy Control recommends using hydrogen peroxide, disinfection of patients with overnight lenses. So, hydrogen peroxide system, I don't know whether it's available in India at the moment or not, but we use that and I use also all in one hypochlorite system. And they are very, very effective at killing the virus or the, the bacteria. So, I mean, ideal for its COVID-19 situation. The enemy for acanthimibar lives in water. So do not have your lenses ever put in water at any time. It's very, very important that this is a patient that's a BCLA even gives us stickers for, to practitioners to put on the lenses or give it to a patient. No water nearby. Opinions vary on drops used for insertion of orthocare lenses. Now, people do use it. I do not, uh, in fact, ask my patient. I just tell them because I use sodium hypochlorite, which is actually the uh, regard solution system, which we just put on the, on the lens and they, they can insert it directly. But you can use thin drops or thick drops. But the thick drops we found was there was adherence for some lens designs, especially if you're doing higher myopia lenses. It is not a very good solution to use for insertion. It has I would advise thin solution for in, uh, insertion. Or even saline solution is good enough for insertion. Now, for insertion, it's, well, it's fi uh, fingers or plunger. Now, I was all, I, I've always been a believer in fingers. I've never actually uh, issued plungers to anybody. Uh, most of my uh, uh, patients have always been uh, trained to put them in and take them out with their fingers. But with COVID case now, I think the rest of the practitioners will be changing too, because again, with the plunger, you need your disinfecting done. So it's a lot more, you know, risk factor. So I would eliminate that. It's uh, Otherwise, if you sterilize it and you have to tell the patient and they have to do it. So one of my colleagues, Matthew Martin, used to believe in it, but I think he has decided now he's going to go off it too. Now, COVID-19, because we are now in a situation where all of us are, dealing with COVID-19, if you're doing ortho K, a lot of practitioners in, in the old days and even today, there are some who are holding trials lenses in their practices and they're fitting from those lenses. Now, I personally have gone off that for past, I think, eight or 10 years now that I only use either the software method of ordering the lenses or just provide the data to the manufacturers who will then send me a lens and from that i'll just check the fit and everything and carry on from there so that with the COVID situation i think that would be the better way to do is send your data to the uh, the suppliers and then get the lens made and sent to you and go from there or if you have a better uh, can get a software to use there are a lot of softwares available on the market now which you can use which again there's another lecture i in future we can do on that too on the software, how to design, where I can show you how live designing can be done on there with the fluorescent picture shown onto you, seen without even putting a lens on the, the eye. So for COVID situation, I think that's the way to go now. Hygiene is going to be very, very important with COVID-19 now. So yourself, you need to protect yourself also. Your staff need to be protected. So in my practice now, we are already, already wearing gloves and wearing masks and you know protect uh, protective uh, gear on it but at the same time we are having patients coming with masks on so if they're coming for insertion uh, and training we are now doing a, what we call video training where we, we put a video uh, on first they watch that then after that they're told to try and put them in and take them out with a because one of the staff members staying within a meter two meters distance and keeping an eye on them if lenses fall on the 
floor or something, then what will be happen is that's when the plunger will be used, a brand new plunger to pick up the lens and then put it back on. And the patient is always told to stay in one place. So insertion and removal technique has changed quite dramatically now. Also, we send them paperwork beforehand. After care routine, again, you have it, you will have to change that a lot more because again, with the slit lamp, now you've got guards you can put in your slit lamps. And if possible, again, if we, um, my case, we've got thousands of patients. So what we are doing is uh, the more monitoring them through basically the internet, like we're doing today, we're talking to each other. Similarly, I'm talking to my patients or my girls are talking, asking them if they've got enough solutions, if they've got, have they got any eye problems. So we are already uh, preemptively talking to them, making sure that they are okay, because they are not, we are not advising them to come to come, uh, practice for an aftercare routine at the moment. Equipment needs to be obviously sanitized and protected. So uh, with the topographer, we tend to uh, completely sterilize it, completely clean it up and make sure every patient. So we keep a time uh, difference between the patients before we get them in. So slit lamp is sterilized, the whole the test room is sterilized before they can come in for an examination. And that will go for your normal eye tests also. So sterilization, sterilization will be the new norm. Again, be prepared to ask the answer the questions to the patients. How the, the simple question is how does sleep time affect vision with ophthalmology? So you explain to them you'll need seven to eight hours of sleep minimum in order to get the good correction. Tell them that over a period of time they may not be 100% required, but initially you need to stick to the routine. And if, if you're doing my IPEC control, you need to tell them upfront that they cannot miss a day. Because kids will be kids. Someday they don't want to go to school. Similarly, they don't want to wear a lens. They'll say, oh, I don't feel well. No, you, unless there's an illness, then yes, but otherwise, no. Does pregnancy affect the vision when using orthokeratology? Now, in my case, oh, with the, what number of years have been fitting contact lenses, once they've been fitted, while if they're pregnant, I avoid fitting them. But if while they've been wearing the lenses and they go pregnant, I carry on. If they become slightly uncomfortable or the lenses are getting much more dirtier, we get them to come in on a regular basis to get them in-house cleaning, which we do a disinfect the lenses and cleaning. Again, the protocol here we have changed slightly in my practice because we used to have every three months patients coming in with their lenses and we would want them to sit there while we get them cleaned and disinfected within 20, 30 minutes time. And even need, need to be slight polish. Obviously, I wouldn't advise you guys to do it because you need to be good at that and modify the lenses. So what we're now doing is the patients are told to leave their lenses at the door. The One of the assistants will pick it up and then get them clean. And then again, when they come in or they've text and phoned when they, before the time and they wait outside and we give it to them, the lenses after they've been sterilized and cleaned properly. So our protocol has, uh, we've changed it slightly. So we, we, before we wanted patients to walk in because we could then uh, sell them sunglasses, etc. But now we're not doing that because of the COVID-19 case. Now, again, explain to them the, the results. It may take time. So day one may be perfect vision in most cases, but it isn't. It may take a week, it may take a month. Can you skip a day that I just told you earlier? No, don't allow that. Be prepared to explain comfort on the first evening and the days following. So tell them that it will be uncomfortable when you put them in the first night. It will get better with time. But stability during the first week or two, obviously it's gonna fluctuate. They're gonna see glare, all hellos. You need to mention that beforehand. You don't want a patient to walk in after a couple of days and say, oh, at night I'm seeing now halos around those lights. But if you told them, then they're not worried. It is part of that if you're doing myopia control lenses. Because myopia control lenses, one has seen most lenses are designed with a six millimeter optic zone. Here we're going to be going 5.4 optic zone. So glare is going to be there. So it needs to be mentioned. Hellos will be there. What data do we need for pre-fitting? Now we need to do topography. We need to do biomicroscopy, which is slit lamp examination, refraction, and refraction. We need to make sure that we're doing binocular vision and unique ocular vision. We need to make sure corneal diameter is measured. Now, corneal <laughs> diameter can be measured on your topographer, or you can actually get a ruler and do it with. 
characterometry readings from the topography, a SIM case. Those are things you will need in order to order the lenses nowadays. Now, if you, if you use the trial set, then obviously work it from there. But in reality, now I would say with COVID-19, we should just provide that data. Now, if you've got a software, you design your lens on there and then order it, or you can go to those suppliers who will take that data and order it for you and send your lens. Topography, I say, is the standard of care. So this is where the investment is very, very important if you're going to go into ortho care properly. I know some areas at the moment, cost-wise, it's difficult, whatever not, but it's something which you need to aim for. And it's required definitely for ortho care fitting. And it will show you before and after effect. So you will know what the correction is, where the lens was sitting. This is the most important instrument we need to see what we need to change if there is a problem with the fitting. When you're taking a topography, a good fixation is a must. Hold the lids carefully, press and skew if you need to, but you need a wide image of and in low room illumination. Good topographers rely on good tear film. So again, tear film is very, very important. I sometimes find if they're not blinking enough, I tend to put some saline solution or you know, uh, you know, uh, some dry eye drops in there just to see it'll get better uh, image. So it's worth doing that. And if you have your own technicians measuring it or your other staff, then train them properly and make sure you see they're coming up with the constant results. If they're not, then it's not point leaving the technician measuring those da that data because topography is the data which you require to get the ortho -K lens. So practice, practice, practice topography, whether it's you or your staff. And my routine always in my practice is I've taken a reading of my own staff. So I pick a staff uh, data, I measure the same staff again and check that it's the same data. So I know my topographer is calibrated. So your topographer has to be checked for calibration too, because that will save you a lot of money when you're ordering lenses. If it's calibrated, it's working properly. And they're out there on the market, there's so many topographers available, so you can use anything, to be honest, and fit lenses nowadays. I personally have got a MedMod and I've used it for past 18 odd years plus now, and it works fine. There's no problem with it. But you can choose what you want, which you feel comfortable with. How do I choose a topographer? In your case, you obviously have to decide. Now, you can ask people like me who have been fitting, or you can go to Vision by Design conference before conferences and where you can see the vendors and play with their instruments and see what you feel comfortable with. Or you can ask the lens manufacturers which they would recommend. Or we have an international academy that's got Author K fellows, so you can ask those fellows who, what they prefer. Because the fellows have done a lot of work on orthokeratology. So they will give you good advice. And this is all available free. It's not going to cost you anything before you buy one. How would you pay for a, a topographer? Now, I look at it this way. Let's, in your practice, if you find, let's say, patients, 10 to 20, uh, 15 patients, and list them all up, and you line them up for to do orthokeratology, then it's very easy. Either you take out a loan and immediately start fitting the patients or get those patients listed up and you know they're really coming off. So you get your topographer ordered. And therefore, when you start fitting those 10, 15 patients and you, if you're charging properly, appropriately, this is not a normal contact lens, then it will be paid for very quickly. So it is important. Now, we do need a service agreement with the patient. We need to make sure that there is a continuation of care. Now, it's very important. Again, there is a whole lecture I do on the, the contract and warranties and whatever you need to provide. But here, we, it's basically continuation of care, replacement of retainers, molds or lenses, whatever you want to call them. What are the terms of the service agreement for year one, two, three, et cetera? And can be an excellent source of residual income. I mean, while with the COVID crisis we have had, we've been, okay, closed, the practice was closed, but the practice was still earning from author K because there is a monthly charges they're paying. The patients have not stopped paying to us and because they want to stay on the system. Once they have been on the system 
they appreciate it and they stay and they're loyal they do actually tell other people too for you you must have a designated person in your practice you must have somebody they can go to to take advice so somebody who can be a MyPay control coordinator or special training and special title you should give so you have one person who will be doing this for you as a practitioner you may not have the time so if you have a person designated person who will talk about also okay and give them information whatever they require what i talk, talked earlier infection what time of wearing time etc you have got that person dealing with that day in day out they could be your emergency number person too so they could deal over the phone before they could get in touch with you so you have somebody who's specially trained who will coordinate for and they can talk about my control everything that could be your practice manager or somebody special in the practice one person because if you have practice where you've got glasses and other condolences is going on the other people can deal with that but also cape it has a special designated person so even in a, when a, somebody walks into a practice they feel that there is somebody they can go to and the other patients even look at that and say why is that person going and sitting down with that person it, it sometimes it, it, we actually get also care patients by other patients just looking at that you know it's you'll be surprised uh, training for insertion and removal of the lenses is different from training for contact lenses so remember you need to take time when you're training orthokeratology patients you need to teach them that there is in the morning you have to make the lens mobile before you take it out because you don't want lens widening taking place so normal condolences that's not re appropriate required so all uh, training has to be different you take your time on that explain about hygiene how they'll do it all this has to be done so Either you now with COVID-19, you get a weird video made up and put that in front of them and they learn from it. And then you can ask questions to make sure that they've got it, you know, into the brain. And if they're paying, train your staff, every staff and fit every staff if possible with also okay. In my practice, when they walk into my practice, none of my staff are actually wearing glasses at the moment. They've all been fitted with also okay. So when they talk, also okay they they are saying from what they, they themselves what they've done so that it's easier for them to talk but also in our case we give, ask them to put ar or quarter glasses just a planner one just uh, at the reception desk or whatever so they, they, those who are coming for glasses think oh why are they wearing glasses and they turn around and say oh i'm wearing it for just to for, for protection against my computer use but that's all now also okay in your practice we decided earlier on decide on what you're calling orthokeratology i call it corneal therapy but you can call it gentle vision shaping corneal refractive therapy corneal molding also okay my control whatever you feel like but it has to be constant so every member of your staff has to say that the same word and how you would be in a consulting room talking about it so you can start off with explaining to them what also K or corneal therapy is that we are going to reshape the cornea the advantage of it if we do my epic control this is what it is 24 hour vision you can get if you wake up in the middle of night you can see very simple explanations like that and the patient may obviously get con convinced and i really look for those patients in your database you do not need to advertise you don't need to go out and you know put in newspapers and radio those patients which i found 99 percent of my patients we found them from my own database they were not originally when we started this they were all from my patient base we had now we are getting them people recommendation and looking for me but before it was basically from my own practice database so your database is your minefield if you dig in there you will find the goal that's where it is for what's okay if you are already a practitioner if you're not a practitioner when you start your practice from day one talk about also okay do not stop you need to be enthusiastic you need to be yourself happy to be, do it then you will succeed good talk here so uh Fakhrizin, can you hear me yes yes i can i can hear you so uh, i think uh, this is the time where uh, i think uh, we would take some questions because you know, the main focus of uh, Sir's uh, session today is to brief everyone on how to start up the practice. It is more on the practice management and give you a spark or give you a hint 
and give you the tips on how you would you know go about starting your practice if you have not and you know how can you do some changes and modify some changes uh, from the tips he has mentioned so i think if you have any questions on uh, what sir has talked about uh, uh, we would take them we will leave the technical questions for future sessions uh, we do have some technical questions in terms of uh, effect of iop and uh, uh, how does myopia control happen i think sir is going to be very kind to take another session and explain it in more detail so and yes and I will, as you can see my next topic would have been also k and how and why it works so we can go through also that those stages too at some point yes depending on time factor yeah so we have one one interesting question uh, can we start ortho k for patient during the covid situation for a new patient what's your take on that i personally think there's no reason why we can't do it as long as we are hygienic the patient has been obviously uh, see uh, my patients before even they walk into the practice now the telephone goes out to them saying well have you got a temperature have you got any sore throat have you got any symptoms of covid 19 or has anybody in your family got it and if they've got it please we cannot make an appointment until 14 days so that's what we're doing so we we have start, started uh, at the moment obviously the government recommendations we cannot do anything except emergency cover cover so i i'm not fitting any but it can be done if the government allows it yeah as long as you are careful with what you're doing and you're protecting yourself and the patient at the same time yeah you know, uh, but uk the government law does not allow us to do that at the moment that's right so once I think everything is fine and we go to practice, there is no harm in fitting uh, ortho -K lenses, provided that we maintain all the all the precautionary measures in terms of hygiene. Yeah, yeah, you may have to wear gloves and put the lens in or insertion and that, but we I don't actually nowadays insert any lenses into patients' eyes. I just say to them, we'll order a custom design lens for you when you come and they sit down in such a removal training is taught by the one of the staff and they put them in, take them out themselves by training. So we're not doing anything there. Then I will force in, I will put in and check the fit, but that's about it. But then you, again, you wear your gloves and make sure, you know, you, you don't touch the eye with your own hands. And obviously you're sterilizing everything immediately. Uh, the other question is, uh, this is related to complications. I would say that what's your experience yeah. that when you have patients with corneal infection with orthokeratology, you would definitely yes. have to refer them to the ophthalmologist. Uh, what is the turnout rate? Will that patient come back or uh, what's, what's your experience on this? Now, my experience of it is because if you know your ophthalmologist where you're sending to, then the ophthalmologists are pretty good if they know why you're doing it and what's the reason behind it. Now, when I say, if I've not had to, to be honest, touch wood, luckily I've not had to refer many patients because we have got a hospital system here, so we have to send them to hospital. But uh, yeah. the the main thing is the ophthalmologist will turn around and say, he's for my epic control, he's doing it for a reason. And they know the risk factors. I have sent them the data beforehand. All the, all the ophthalmologists in Leicester more or less know me. So they know why I'm doing it, you know. And now they're becoming even more aware of it. As you probably saw in India, I don't know whether you were there in Mumbai, the conference, the last revision by design. I didn't ophthalmologist by video, he couldn't make it. But he actually was talk talking about his own experience of his daughter and himself wearing the ortho yeah. So you need to, whoever you're sending to say why you're giving those lenses. And obviously the infection should be a protocol. You do not want an infection. So at all costs, you're going to try and avoid that if possible. This should be the last issue on your mind or to the patient even. That's right. And I had yeah. one patient where we had a child who went to, I think they went on uh, to Iran or somewhere and they came back. And it picked up an infection in Iran. And initially, when they went to the ophthalmologist, they didn't even come to see me. The ophthalmologist thought it was the lenses that had caused the, uh, the infection. But the thing was, that when they went to Iran, for some reason, they'd forgotten the lenses. And the, the kid who wasn't wearing any lenses had got an infection. So he, he was a new one. And he rang me up and says, Nitesh, what's, what's going on here? And I says, obviously, he's got an infection. Any lens would give you an infection. And then while the patient was here, was sitting and says, I wasn't wearing any lenses, you know, in front of him. And the, the story was just stopped there. That's right. Yeah. 
So do you think like when when people want to start orthokeratology, we must have, uh, you know, a tie up with an ophthalmologist or we must have a backup ophthalmologist with us? Do you think that I would help? prefer at some point to, to have a tie up? It would be better to tie up with an ophthalmologist because in India, the regulations are slightly different to the UK. And the more I'm now, you know, looking into India and finding out that without your ophthalmologist uh, supporting you, you will have a bit of an issue there. I don't know what's the situation in Malaysia, but in and the rest of the Southeast Asia, but in Vietnam, I know that the ophthalmologists, the optometry university where they're doing in Hanoi are working with the ophthalmologists who are supporting them. But in India, you need ophthalmologists on your side. And there are a lot of ophthalmologists now I've met in Mumbai and elsewhere are actually keen to do this because they are now here reading about this in you know their own journals and whatever not that my epic control of psychiatry is a good idea so why not work with them rather than fight with them yeah so make there them are a lot of tech make them you know if you're in an area where you, let's say send them information on the character send them information on my epic control you know phone them up talk to them say can i come and talk to you i want to do this you know would you help me so yeah. that, that would work that's right and uh, there are a lot of technical questions on uh, how much cornea molding is required on uh, the treatment of one diopter i think we'll keep all the technical questions uh, for for the next time uh, if that's okay yeah because, because i think you see, you... i've got a whole lecture on that if you can see author k and how and why it works you know so yeah. it's how many microns you would need to flatten the cornea for a yes. half a diopter you know, we yeah. can answer those questions quite easily, but it said it'd be better if you do it properly with topography maps to show it also. Yeah, so I think we'll keep all the technical questions to on hold. Sorry to the participants, but this is mostly towards the practice management and, you know, startup of a practice. That's the whole uh, agenda and the whole objectives of the today's session. Uh, one question is, what do you think about starting orthokeratology without a corneal topographer? I know your answer personally, but uh, that question has been popped out twice, so I just thought I'll ask you that. See, if I, if you, I don't know, you were there for in Vietnam, if you remember, and we know that there are not many topographers in Vietnam, and similar with India and Malaysia. I don't know again the situation, but uh, what the same question was asked to me there, and we said I can fit with the keratometer readings quite easily. That's fitting is not the problem. It's the aftercare where you need a topographer. And the topographer makes it a lot life easier for you. Because if you know where the lens has moved to, you can change that to fit. And so you can save a lot of money. So yes, topography initially is costly, but it will save you a lot of money. In my case, I talk in uh, at pounds, but you can talk in rupees. It's going to save you thousands of rupees overall if you yeah. get the topographer. But it, I mean, in the old days, we all used to fit with character That's all I used to use. But you have to be keen on that. And, you know, you've fitted a lot of RGP lenses beforehand to know what's going on. So personally speaking, why not make it easy life for yourself? That's why I say now it's okay with the software designing. It's a lot easier. And let's take one last question about uh, about this. This is, this is a bit of... Uh, the topographer so i think people are asking what do you recommend which topographer do you think would be the best if they are to start the practice because there are so many available topographers so there's so many available but what i would say to you is as a practitioner what i've fitted and i know a lot of my colleagues are fitting are using medmont at the moment so i'm not uh, employed by medmont i don't work for medmont so please do not you know think that i'm promoting it because I've got no financial you know, dealings with that. So I need to clarify that. But MedMod, I've used it ever since I was, you know, when I got my topography. I used to fit before topography, as I said to you before. But when I got it, it was reliable. I, I was at one of the, uh, the uh, conferences in America. I saw it, I played with it, and I liked it. And it's, uh, a lot of software is available with that topographer also to use with. So in those days when I had it, you didn't even have a software attached to it. Now you can attach a lot more software to it and design lenses very quickly. So to me, MedMod has been very reliable for me. And it's a machine that doesn't go wrong much. I've had no other issues, except if you have software updates, then they'll obviously charge you for it. But 
I used to use the 3.1, which was the original, you know, software. And for 10 years, I had not updated it, which I, hopefully the top guy, top one guys are, uh, you know, Medmont guys are not listening. But then, then they updated it for me, and I had to pay for that. But you know, it has to be updated at every few years, the software. So you'll be end up paying for the software rather than the actual equipment. Okay. And uh, the trial length set. So is there any relation of, let's say, we decide to, you know, keep the trial lens or the this brand a and yeah. uh, do we need to uh, ask them on what topographic data do they need or they are all like universal see there are some uh, brands i mean I, again you've been to my conferences you've seen all the brands available uh, who have turned up on the conferences one of the brands that believes in a trial lens is to check for the diameter and everything else and the fitting uh, on the lens itself rather than even topography so Every uh, you know trial lens uh, supplier will have their own ins and outs. But I will say, if you're going to get a trial lens, you will have to fit it and check it and make sure that it works. And now, I mean, the old days. I mean, again, my colleagues from all over the world who have been fitting for a long time used to like it. I mean, I used to like it. Was if you had I've got a minus four and you put a trial lens, they uh, corrects it. You know, within an hour or two hours, and you show it to. And you've seen the wow factor at all the conferences we've done. Well, they can see quite well. So it's okay work. So there was a wow factor wise trial lenses are good. But COVID-19 is changing that situation now. So, you know, that's up to the person what they want to. But try all the trial sets which are available, you know. And I ideally try them when you're at the conferences. So it's not costing you anything. Yeah. You know, that's you why we with the webinar is a yeah. good idea. But at some point we need these practical sessions where people can try it. That's right. Yeah. Okay, I think we have uh, we have taken most of the questions on practice management. Uh, I would just remind everyone that uh, we are not taking the technical questions, and we would let you know when we can plan the next session where a uh, sir will actually cover on how does ortho K work and what are the different techniques where uh, you know you can apply in myopia control or normal refractive part. Can I just uh, go on one thing? There is Himanshu has asked yes, a very good question here. Sorry, if you don't yeah. mind me. Yes, please. Yes, asked, yes, yes. Go ahead. Ortho K is a temporary treatment for myopia? Question mark. Mm -hmm. Now, Ortho K in, in, is a temporary uh, treatment for myopia? Yes, he is right. But there is a big but to it now, which I have found in my practice. Which I think maybe on Facebook somebody asked me, somebody was talking about this, and I answered that question to them. If you use vision therapy properly and orthokeratology, you can reverse myopia. Now, that's a, some, something to talk about in the future. Yeah. The question is right that yes, it is a temporary treatment, but we are doing ortho now for myopia control. But it can be reversed if the right form of vision therapy is also applied to it. Okay, okay, so that you think about for you guys. Yeah, yeah, so we, we have got a question now to think for before the next session, so we have some thoughts in our mind yeah. on how. Yeah, so yeah, sir, we'll elaborate this in, in the future session, as I mentioned it a couple of times, that this is on practice management. Uh, the idea behind the talk is to just kickstart on how to you know start our practice and what are the key points we need to understand on if we are going on to an orthokeratologic practice so thank you sir for this uh, very insightful and a wonderful talk uh, we really appreciate your time and i'd like to thank you all for listening and as i said uh, hopefully as i said you will get excited and want to fit off okay and want to learn more because even i'm learning every day so learning is no harm it's it's a good thing so let's all work together. Yes, uh, surely, surely. And uh, yes, a couple of people are asking for sessions on ortho -K and dry eye and fitting of ortho -K. Uh, We will keep you posted via the email and the WhatsApp group what we have uh, on when the next session will be on. So thank you, everyone, for attending uh, today's session. And before we leave, uh, I would just like to share my screen. and. Uh, I would just like everybody to know about the session, what we have tomorrow. We have Dr. Ramesh from India, and he is going to talk about glaucoma practice post-COVID and what are the possibilities 
and how should we go about this so please tune in tomorrow uh, tomorrow the session is at 2 p.m afternoon indian time and 4 30 uh, evening malaysian time so i hope to see you all tomorrow until then stay home stay safe and take care bye